think I watched it like tangentially. I was Being, never a big Fr- Friends fan. That whole level, that that level of just neurotic depression that he had, that hi, the, that first greeting. Yeah. This is how this guy read the entire book from back to front. <laughs> just absolutely concerned, worried, and depressed all at the same time. Do you know what the name <laughs> of the narrator is? Let's see. I'm 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 looking it up right now because the narrator was just I'm try I don't want to try to play the book. Hold on. Well, Matt did the audiobook, so he probably Scott Brick is the name of the guy. Oh, he's actually he the does. the guy that read most of uh, Richard Matheson's books. Yeah, he does a lot of them. Um, he did Dune. Matt likes Scott Brick, but. You know, if he was directed to be like, be sad, well. Well, I mean, g- given the, the nature and the content of the book and how it starts, the guy is going to be naturally sad. Yeah. This was but, uh, way, way more bleak than the movie. I would like to listen to some of his other performances, because I want to know if it was just something in the way that he approached the reading of this book. Well, he did all the Dune books. All of them? All of them. I'm looking at all these. He did Run. a bunch of Ender's Game books. He did uh, He did a couple of uh, Louis L'Amour novels, some Tom Clancy stuff. Wow. He's done a lot. Jeez. Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park. He's got 25 pages. Jeez. So he is a uh, prolific reader for this. Song. Yeah. Oh. Ooh. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> he did uh, Blade it Runner. Was... <laughs> I mean, if Matt actually sat down and listened to this guy do this particular book, he could probably confirm that this guy it, you it was a melodramatic the... performance. You listened to the audiobook, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, by, the, by Scott Brick. It was read by Scott oh, Brick. Oh, Scott Brick. I love Scott Brick. Yeah, well, <laughs> Chris was saying he was very melodramatic reading this book. Oh, he is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he, was... did, he did all the uh, Born Identity series books. I was telling her that he, he had that level of just depression and anxiety throughout the book. Just like the first episode of Friends when you're introduced to him and he's just found out that his wife's a lesbian and broke up with him. Like Ross. So just that initial introduction where he's just like, hi, you know, that's just how he approached this entire book. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. He. um, Yeah. Yeah. I I really like Scott Brick's narration. Yeah. Well, this book is written by. Okay, I guess we should start with. Yeah, I hit record because we were already chatting. All right. I guess we should start with, hi, I'm Rachel. And I'm Matt. Uh, oh, am I supposed to say something now? <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and I, I am Chris. Uh, <laughs> and apparently very out of sync with how they're doing things over here. <laughs> Welcome to the Strange and Beautiful Book Club. To be fair, every other time we've had a guest, before we do the intro, Rachel says, okay, just so you know, we usually start our podcast with, I am Rachel, and then Matt says, and I'm Matt, and then you will say, and I'm name. Yeah, but they never get it anyway, so I was going to try didn't just... Even prep you jeez i was just gonna try dumping chris in the deep end see if you keep up because every other person is like well do do i talk now yes just like i just said hi i'm rachel hi i'm matt and then (laughs) 
And then uh, I stare at the uh, screen ahead of me like I'm a deer <laughs> in headlights. Okay. I always edit out the gaps, <laughs> we'll so it, it sounds like we could, we'll fix it. Post. That's what audio editing is all about. <laughs> so yeah. we're going to talk about uh, Somewhere in Time, the book, which was Bid Time Return. And then I guess he thought the movie title was better. So he was like, well, let's just go with that. And it's by Richard Matheson, who did I Am Legend yep. and quite a few other like greats of the sci-fi and horror genre. Uh, what but Dreams this, May Come. Yeah, What Dreams May Come. One of my favorite movies. Yeah. Uh, this is, we did the movie for uh, Chris's podcast, Cinematic Anarchy, which if you haven't checked it out, go check it out. Uh, which I do plug you in Dan's episode, too. So that's my second plug this month. Hey, um, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. I'll, I'll always. So uh, we we decided we would do the book on the book club podcast. So Chris generously read it. And uh, yeah, <laughs> now we have a lot to talk generously. about. <laughs> well, well the, the movie itself left so many questions unanswered that I, it just left an itch at the back of my head. And I'm like, I right. have to find out if... A, B, and C are the same in the book, or if they explain it a little bit more, like Christopher Plummer's character was just, there was not enough information. And then I listened to the book and realized that they did nothing to resolve that for me outside yeah, surprise, of... Surprise! They explained <laughs> less. <laughs> they basically made him a less important character in the book. Yeah. yeah. For the most part. Yeah. So I Am Legend is a novella. It's a very short, short, it's a short story. Mm. And I feel like maybe that's where Richard Matheson excels. Because this is the first novel length book of his that I've read. And it probably could have been a short story. Probably like Philip K. Dick, too. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're halfway Better through the short story. He doesn't even go back in time at all until halfway through the book. And this is Literally. not a short book. This is like a 300 page book. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, I liked, don't get me wrong, I liked it. I listened to it approximately four times as of uh, today. Wow. Whoa. And wow. I caused a bit of discomfort uh, with my son uh -oh. uh, because of this book. So <laughs> I'm, today, just to refresh my, my mind as to what we were doing, because it, it took a little bit, and uh, I uh, was playing the book at one and a half speed. Okay. Just listening to it throughout the day. I started at the beginning of the day as I was working. By the time I got in my car and came over here to pick up my son, the uh, end of the book was playing. And the uh, <laughs> oh, good. last 30 minutes of that is the, uh, the sex graphic. Once again, with feeling. <laughs> Three times the, with feeling. <laughs> the penthouse forum level <laughs> sex scene in the book. <laughs> And my son opened the door, and the first words that pour out of the car is pink nipples. And he's just like, what the <laughs> hell are you listening to? Listen, I've read a book this called... This is literature. I've read a book called Morning Glory Milking Farm um, about minotaurs. And it's exactly what you think it is. Milking farm. Yes, That's... milking uh, minotaurs, which Don't are need the morning glory so part. Just, just leave milking you know, farm just, there. Yeah, okay, so... Um, this was not as bad as it could have been, <laughs> to be fair. By modern smut standards. But also, um, I don't know that Richard Matheson has ever actually been with a woman, because I don't know what that <laughs> sex scene was, but <laughs> three times, Richard? Three I, three times? I think uh, he was definitely channeling a little bit of Christopher Reeve there as Superman. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of extra stamina. Uh, mm -hmm. But you also are dealing with a guy that uh, A, has been pent up and obsessed about this woman, and B, has shed himself of his, well, we haven't really gotten to the beginning of the book, but uh, shed himself of his cancer by having gone back in time. Yeah. Well, I just want to read the part that leads up to the sex scene well, while we're on cancer it. before cancer was invented. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> so while we're on it, because I marked it specifically in my book because it's so ridiculous. With a shuddering breath, she clung to me. Forget what I said about women, she murmured. No, I don't mean forget it. Just remember that it's only part of what I feel and what I need. 
The other part is what I'm feeling now, the part that's been unfulfilled for such a long, long time. I pretended not to know what it was, but I always knew. I felt her arms tighten around my back. It was my feminine nature, and it was unfed. It hungered, Richard. (laughs) Hungered for that dick. (laughs) I was like, what the hell is happening? (laughs) Like, they took her personality and literally just threw it out the window in the last 30 minutes of the novel. Yeah. 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 It was very much like, well, now that I've got her, uh, it's like a a weird Victorian manic pixie dream girl. That's what she is. Mm Mm-hmm. Essentially. She, yeah, she doesn't have to. He he just gets her. She doesn't have like, and he offers nothing. He brings nothing to the relationship. He has no money. He doesn't. He doesn't actually exist in that timeline. Nothing. And yet she's like, I'm drawn to you inexplicably, and I think I'll take you to my bed three times in a inexplicably. row. Inexplicably. Inexplicably. Yeah. So it starts the same way in the book that it does in the movie, where he's in the 1970s. He's a writer, but in the book, he has brain cancer. Womp, womp. And he didn't know. Temporal lobe tumor. Right. He didn't know he had it because he thought the headaches were stress because he was a TV writer. And then he realized, oops, I have cancer. And he has like three to six months to live. And so when we pick up with him, he is recording his memoirs on a tape recorder. So they're quite short little snippets. Of like, I stayed here, I did this, I moved here, I did that. Because he's cashed out all of his life savings and he's just left. Left and left no note, just gone. And he ends up at not the Grand because he's out in California. He ends up at, um, is it the Coronado? I believe it's the Coronado, yes. From Some Like It uh, Hot. Yeah. Featured in Some Like It Hot. Right. And that's where he stays. And they were going to use that for the movie, but they'd updated it. And so it didn't, it looked like it was from the seventies. So they were like, "Never mind, we'll use the grand. They haven't updated anything ever. And he ends up staying there because he's walking through the room and he sees a picture of Elise. And he's like, oh, I want to hit that. I'm just gonna, like in the movie. Just like in the movie, but he becomes obsessed with her. And he studies everything about her and... We don't get the mysterious professor who's like, oh, no, I've traveled in time. It's fine. Let me tell you how to do it. He's got to, like, read a book about it. And then it takes him a long time. And you're never sure if he's actually traveling back in time or is it the frontal lobe tumor that's just distorting his perception of what's actually happening. Right, because that's one of the signs or the 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 uh, side effects of having that particular type of tumor is uh, hallucinations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, almost as if you could hallucinate that you were back in 1896, which is how far back he travels. It's uh, entirely possible that he had some graphic hallucinations based off of his just obsession with that one picture. Yeah. yeah. Like you get that feeling... From the beginning of the novel, you get that feeling that there is just a sense of, of desperation just to cling on to something. He's he's leaving. He's on a, a journey. He knows that the journey's end is just him dying. Right. And he's looking for something to cling on to from point A to point B. And that picture was his focus. Yep. And he gets that book. And I love that he cuts out a picture from the book and frames it and puts it on his bedside table. He's like. <laughs> It's fine. What are they going to do? I'm going to die anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what are they going to do? Kind of his approach with everything. I don't uh, yeah, plan to pay fine. my bills anymore. I'm going to be a criminal. I don't even care. Yeah, it's fine. Mm-hmm. What, am I, what are they going to do? I'm dying. Who gives a shit? And he, <laughs> a lot of it is similar but different where he goes and gets the costume. Um, he cleans out his room, progressively cleans it out until he has like nothing And then he ends up convincing himself. But he's like really sick when he first goes back, which I thought was really interesting. Like that that's how you're like, oh, okay. So the effort of going back made you actually ill. Instead of in this one where he's just like, ha ha, I'm awake. I have made it to the past. I think that was somewhat the residual of him actually being sick because he had yeah. illness. He had a tumor that was constantly giving him headaches to the point that he couldn't even go outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And so I think some of that residual of him going back in time, that illness, that weakness, was just the residual of him basically shaking off the cancer that he left behind. Right. Kind yeah, he, of, he left the tumor in the 70s. Yeah, he didn't pack it. It's fine. It would well, have it, reminded him of the 70s, so he left it behind. It's, <laughs> it, it's 1890. It hasn't grown yet. Yeah, it, that's one of the things that kind of lends itself to the it's probably hallucination is as soon as he's in the past, he's fine. As soon as he's succeeded in making it to Elise, he's everything is OK. Mm -hmm. That solves I, all of his problems. I think he got in bed, was chanting to himself. I mean, this is his manuscript that he basically wrote down in tape form. So he was recording yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that he never left the room, that he never left the bed. I think that's like, yeah. that's probably my sense of this too, because, because if he, if he still had cancer and he forgets about his cancer at all, like he's planning his future with Elise. He's like, you know, thinking about when they grow old together, mm -hmm. like he just completely disregards it. It's as if like he's entered a fantasy world where he doesn't have it. And he's found this object of his desire and he gets everything. And the only thing that pulls him out of it again is a penny or he, he pulls the penny out and he feels compelled to pull it out, which I thought was an interesting thing. Cause in the, in the movie, you're like, wait, you know what that is. Just leave it in your pocket. But in the book, it's like, oh no, I was compelled to remove it and look at it. Yeah. And yeah, in the movie, 19... it made him look like an idiot. And uh Yeah. In the book, it was just sort of something, not necessarily, it was against his will. Right. Just sort of, okay, it's there, I have to fish it out. A little bit of OCD. Just Well, like, I'm com you're compelled to go back to your time. Because, and he never really clears up, like, how can he occupy a time where he never existed? Because he reads that, that time book, that book about time, and it theorizes you can only travel in your own timeline because that's the path that you can move back and forth on. Yeah, but he says fuck that. And he's like, no, I can figure this out because I'm destined to be with Elise. And so... <laughs> <laughs> yes. One of the main differences between the movie and the book is that he knew full well when he went back in time that he is going to ruin this woman's life. Yeah. Yep. And he did not care. He's like, no, you know what? I can I, change things. He kind of thinks <laughs> that he can change it. Yeah. Maybe from, this time will be different. He can change it from the history that he read in the book about Elise and actually stay and make her life happier. Yet at the same time is completely convinced that because he went back before, he'll be able to go back this time. Right. So like that thing won't change. That's fine. But the right. part and, where I totally ruin her life. I'm, I'm going to fix that. Yeah, be, I'm, I'm because, because there's evidence I was there, the timeline is fixed. It's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. But the <laughs> other part, no, the timeline's not fixed. I can change it. Things can <laughs> yeah, happen he was differently. Basically right. uh, diluting himself within his own delusion. Right. Yeah. And it makes it far less romantic because you're like, oh, you knew and you did not care. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. very little about this book that felt romantic. Right. Whereas very the little. movie, I thought, felt like the changes they made in the movie, it ends up feeling very romantic. Mm -hmm. It helps that it's Christopher Reeve. But also, <laughs> I, I didn't, I felt like that was a lot more romantic than I'm a dude with brain cancer. I fell in love with this hot chick. I'm going to mind my way. I'm going to like mental mind my way back there. So. I can have like a basically a one night stand and then dip. Not for nothing. I would pay good money to see Christopher Reeve do this version. <laughs> I really the, would. The sad, selfish TV executive who Just falls in love with the past actress. The original material, yes. Yeah. I would pay good money to see this because now I do appreciate having read the book after watching the movie because I still like them both. Yeah. He'd get Doesn't, to blow out the candle two more times. <laughs> I like that uh, they basically threw away, for the movie, they created the uh, plot point that, uh, now I'm going to forget his name. What was uh, Christopher, Christopher Plummer's Plummer. character? His character. 
Yeah, that he uh, did the, the he told the her that the guy was coming. Right. They basically created that plot point. I'm guessing because using the gypsy angle was probably even back then not quite as uh, not quite the way they wanted to go. Not as PC even for the seventies. Like uh, well, maybe the gypsy angle doesn't. Yeah. Work. Yeah. yeah, didn't she get told twice? Yeah, she got the, yeah, I think the gypsy, and then uh, there was something about a Native American woman, but I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was. It was somebody it was within two, her. It was like the one-two punch of problematic people. It was like right. first the Native American mysticism told me about it, and then the gypsies told me about it. So it's like, and they're both telling me to be on the beach when I'm here. Right, so I'm on the beach because he does the same thing where he walks up and he's like. She goes, "Is it you?" And he's like, "Hell yeah!" Yeah, what? it's me. I'm going to tell her what I what uh, what I, she wants to hear from me because I want to just skip past all the explanation stuff and get right mm-hmm. in. There. Right, and then he just refuses to leave her side until she's like, "I mean, oh, fine, I, you can like eat. I got to eat. I got to eat dinner." And then he's so judgy. Like they go to <laughs> yeah. eat dinner and everybody's eating like 1896 food, and he's like, "Gross! I just want." Beef broth. He drinks like beef broth. Consume. My, my favorite bit of uh, Collier judgment in the entire book is him constantly going, are people shorter now? <laughs> it's like, are the chairs smaller? Everybody's shorter. Like, I'm picturing Christopher Plummer's character in this uh, in this book. He, I'm saying Christopher Plummer because I can't remember the name of the damn guy for the life of me. Is it Wilkinson or something? Um, Wilkinson. I'm Robertson something. Jeez. Fine. It's you only read the me. book four times. It's fine. Right. I only read, I only listened to it four Robinson? times. Robinson. There we go. Yeah. Robinson. And I don't picture him as a Christopher Plummer type character. I pick it, picture him almost as like Zach Galifianakis or uh, <laughs> yeah, Josh he's Gad. Round. Yeah. He's like portly. He's a lot supposed of to the be people portly, are portly. Plump. Yeah. And then. Yeah, he's, he's supposed col- to be uneducated. Yeah, and Collier is calling people fat the whole time he's there. He's like, wow, everybody's eating a lot of food. Wow, I can tell. <laughs> wow. And you're like, okay, wow. This isn't even your time. <laughs> you came here. You crashed it. You're about to ruin this woman's life. We all know it. And then you're going to leave, which is exactly what he does because he sticks with her and she's like mad. She's like low key mad at him the whole time. Yeah. Up until she's not, and then she's desperately in love with him. And she's like, hey, you want to go to my train car, my private train car? Which she apologizes for. She's like, sorry, this looks like I'm a rich person, because I am. But also, like, I didn't pick the decor. And he goes, and he's like, yeah, I'm glad you told me you didn't, because it's gross. <laughs> You're like, well, you are just terrible. Like, <laughs> Richard Collier in the book is not a romantic, like, he's not a lovable character. No. No, not at He's all. He's whiny. I love how he gets trapped in that guy's room. He can't get out because he travels back in time and he steals his straight razor and carves a hole in the door. And then he's like, ha ha, I'm glad. <laughs> no one's ever going to figure out that mystery. <laughs> uh, well, it's not like they had cameras back then. No, I know. That's exactly. He's like, ha ha, it'll still be fine. And then he goes and buys like he buys. They have like a shop in the basement. It was yeah. weird. Bought all yeah, the stuff that cut himself 14 times with the yeah. blade. Yeah, which they put in the movie, and it's cute in the movie. Yeah. Because okay. he has the stuff on his face all day. I've never seen mm-hmm. toilet paper stick to somebody's face that long, but that's fine. Uh, I've, I've all done the, it. I have all the shaving acumen of a first-time 14-year-old with a straight razor, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, some people you don't hand that blade to. Yeah. We get to see her play, which is a made up play for the book. I'm pretty sure. And it's the most like, I don't want to see this play through Richard Collier's eyes. Like, I'm bored. You're uncomfortable the whole time. He's like, Look how good she is at this. Look at her feet. Even, yeah, even through his (laughs) eyes, he wasn't watching the play. He was Mm. focused on her feet. Like, that's one of the first notes that I had on this book. The first listen through, it's like I had to stop and go, Unrealized foot fetish. (laughs) <laughs> you know, because that is the well, first he, note. He adjusted himself to the sensibilities of the time. Sure. Where a woman's feet would have been you know, a, a secondary sex characteristic. 
Well, he had some some overly sexualized thoughts throughout the entire book, including like the first kind of paranoia that he had about going back in time while laying in the bed was accidentally popping up in between a couple of people copulating. Yeah. 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 It was really that would be really awkward. And he kind of went into detail about it for a second. And it's like, uh, OK, well, now I kind of <laughs> have an idea where this guy's headspace is. Yeah. Second time listening to the book, the foot fetish thing didn't catch me off guard quite as much. I kind of want to read What <laughs> Dreams May Come, because that's also a very like romance driven movie. And I Mm want to read the book because I want to know, is it just that Richard Matheson is supremely incapable of creating a lovable character that also loves a woman or (laughs) I could almost somewhere in time. I could almost see now now that I'm thinking about it, because you watch what dreams may come and you watch somewhere in time. Christopher Reeve definitely, I don't think, could have pulled off the same kind of melodrama that, I, I don't want to say melodrama, but you felt the pain coming from Robin Williams in What Dream may Co- what yeah. Dreams May Come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. He could have approached the other movie the exact same way. I'm just not sure you're going to get that level of performance out of Christopher Reeve as much as I love him as an actor. Right. I'm just saying this book is, the movie's romantic. The book is not romantic. Right. Come what what, what dreams, dreams may come. come is romantic. The but movie is the book romantic. Is the book romantic, or is the male character as unlikable as Richard Collier? Like, is this a Richard Matheson problem, or is this an intentional somewhere in time thing? Like, is what? he supposed to be unlikable? Should I, I ask know. the obvious question right here? Like, I mean, do we feel another Richard Matheson two for coming up? <laughs> I mean, I feel like Matt would do it because he's like, yeah. Yes, I no. would read what dreams may come. <laughs> yeah. And slink on over to my podcast. We can talk about the movie. Then we'll come over here. We can probably do it in one <laughs> evening now that we know what we're going to do, though. Right. Yeah, yeah we can come you prepared know? for it. Knock because... out both episodes one evening. <laughs> because I like that. I want to know, like, I did he think this guy was a good guy? Like, did he think this was playing out really well? And he was like, everyone's going to love Richard Collier. He's so hot. Like, especially this line, my favorite. I marked it also. Um, Where he's he's amazed because she seems like a liberated woman in 1896. And it says... <laughs> The other was something akin to awe at being suddenly exposed to the depth of this woman I had fallen in love with. Clearly, I could not have seen this depth in a faded photograph, and yet she possesses something I admire most in a woman, progressive individuality contained within a discreet nature. And then we throw all that out for the last two chapters of the book. Well... Just it, it, progressive individuality, <laughs> but still ladylike about it. So it, that's it. Kind of oh. <laughs> reminds me about of the description um, in Atlas Shrugged when oh yeah he gives her the bracelet and the most ladylike of the all most attributes, feminine. Yeah, the most feminine of all traits. The, the look, look of, of being, being chained. chained. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> if you haven't read Atlas Shrugged, <laughs> yeah, I'm Super not sure that's a selling point. Sex. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's some good bits, but there's some bad bits too. Yeah, that. Yeah, I know there's like a two part movie. I think three parts Atlas. now. It's not, three parts. It's yeah, not and they like can't a, like they couldn't get the actors back for each one, so you have to re like. They re they had to recast a bunch of parts for each movie. <laughs> yeah, like if you're gonna yeah, do a not... three part film, why wouldn't you just film the whole thing and then break it into three parts? Not like oh, we filmed the first part. No, no, I need you to come back. It's one what, of those why like would you come crowd back? funded, like oh, okay. independent. They just that did what they sense. could when they could. Mm-hmm. Not nah, hell with that. We don't want to do this again. Okay, we'll find some other suckers to do this. Here's another good come example on. of how bad he is at writing this woman. Oh no! Here we go. Okay. I marked three places. I've already read two. This is the last one you have to sit through. It says, here with you, these moments, I have such a longing to be weak, to give myself entirely, be taken care of, to release that bound up woman from my mind, 
the woman I have held a captive all these years, because I felt that it was what she needed. I want to let her go now, Richard. I want to let her be protected. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. Yeah, I knew listening to it. No. <laughs> how Rachel was going <laughs> to feel about that. And then we're, well, we're reading the book knowing full well, yeah, don't worry. In about 15 minutes, you're going to be like, no, I'm just going to protect myself. Hell with this asshole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, in... We start out with this character, Elise, is this really independent woman in 1896 who has her own career, her own money, her own life. She's on track to be the most famous actress in America. Mm -mm. And then... Not that point in her life, she was not. If you remember all the stuff that he read about her leading up to that. Oh, that's right. She wasn't as good as she could be. And then later, something happens at the Coronado, the (laughs) Coronado scandal. And then she accesses a depth of emotion in herself that she had never previously displayed. And what she needed, apparently, was that dick. A one night stand. (laughs) Richard Collier's. Three, I can't. The three times was what broke me. I was like, okay, this I got it. I'm making it. And then we got to the part where they finally get together, and he's like, oh, and then she wanted it again. And but then this is how then we she know. wanted it again. I was and like, we have this conversations. Is how we know it is a hallucination. Yeah. <laughs> this is all a fantasy in his head. <laughs> the three times, and we know for sure because he performed three times in a row. Yeah, he was really, really hot for her, honey. And he was. If it she was, she sat up and threw her arms out to the side, like that's a thing that women do. Apparently. Uh, is it okay? I, that's I called know. possession. They do that in The Exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> Linda Blair has that down pat. <laughs> that's exactly what happened in that scene. It's uh, yeah. Well, she was hungry, as she said. But I, did, yeah, no. They have like two seconds of conversation, and he's like, "I'm gonna go again." No, no. No. No, 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 no. First of all, okay. I'm physiologically, men need more time than that. This is her first time, theoretically, right? This is it. This is the first time that she's ever been with a man. Yeah. <laughs> There's a healing process that has to happen after that, and you're not necessarily interested. Like twenty minutes later. The sex scenes from Collier's perspective were also very uncomfortable. Right. It was very man writing a sex scene. The yeah. visual yeah. of him basically saying that he flooded her and <laughs> hopes that he impregnated her. Yes. I'm just picturing myself. The whole time he's it like, caters yeah, to the male gaze. I'm, I'm making that baby. And you're like, oh, my God. It is hey, 1896. You are not married. You are ruining her life right now. She's probably hey. going to die in childbirth. <laughs> Richard, I mean, you, you've read the books already. You know there's no kid. Yeah. Whatever you've got going on was not strong enough to impregnate the woman. Just... Well, it would change the timeline. <laughs> it would. So, and so, then he uh, could die two months later of brain cancer that he forgot he had. Mm-hmm. <sighs> <laughs> This, yeah. yeah, it it didn't clear up a lot for me regarding my my questions with the movie and how he approached that at all. No, no. First, the Robinson character is almost completely removed. Yeah, He's just bro- an asshole. Broad strokes, it's basically yeah. the same plot. Yeah, but the movie was a faithful adaptation of the book with some flair to make it a little bit more palatable. Yeah. It's the studio. I'll guarantee you the studio is like, no, we really don't want this level of unlikability in the character. We need yeah. to kind of, we need to make it a romantic film. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that leaves a lot of his dialogue and uh, internal monologues on the floor, period. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. His upset, like it, and you got to shorten his obsession, like the period of time where it's just mm-hmm. him focused on her. And I mean, you got to do that for the movie anyway, so it works. Yeah. I don't know why they chose to give Christopher Plummer the job of telling Elise that Richard Collier was going to come meet her because it just opens up this whole, but why? Like, but how? Uh, I can see dropping the... What if she had recurring dreams I can see dropping the Native American and the gypsy. I'm cool with that. 
But like we don't see him do. We could have had that line could have had anything in it. It could have been I dreamed of you. Mm-hmm. It could have been like you know, once I had my fortune told and they told yeah. me that. Traveling fortune teller. You don't need to lean on gypsy or Native American princess no, or whatever anything. they leaned on. Yeah, it, it could have been anything. And then instead they're like, no, he knows things that are going to happen before they happen. And now you're like, okay, well, is he a time traveler? Right. You're planting some seeds and then we're not harvesting any right. of that. Right. So it I mean, ended up just leaving more questions because you're like, but wait, how, why did you solve the problem that way? It just Were you hoping for a sequel, like the Christopher Plummer spy sequel? <laughs> <laughs> Turns out Christopher Plummer is his son coming back to prevent him from... That's what I proposed. Yeah. Protecting Elise from his father. Basically trying to sacrifice himself to keep his father from impregnating his mother, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would make Richard Collier's wish in the the sex scene come true. Yeah. Where he's like, Yeah, I hope we're gonna I hope we're having my baby. And you're like, please, this is my God. <laughs> I mean, I understood Robinson's character better in the book than I did the movie. Like there was a lot of missing information with Robinson in the movie. The book kind of explained him as an asshole and just overprotective, undereducated, and was probably completely in love with Elise. But due to his station, there's not much he could do about it. Right. So he mm-hmm. basically spent his life trying to make her or elevate her to a point where nobody else would be suitable for her. Right. And you're like, okay, I get that. That makes a lot. There were a lot of things in the book that made more sense than they did in the movie. But the love, the love story is the movie. The book is like fleshing out all of the details. So if you like the love story, don't bother with the book. If you want more details, Ooh. read the book. Because Richard Collier in this book is despicable, <laughs> yeah. to say the, the very least. And then as soon as they have their night, their Coronado scandal... Mm -hmm. He pulls the penny out and he gets whisked back to the present. And then he just goes back to his brother's house and dies. Gives up. Gives up. And then his brother finds all of his memoirs. And he's about to tell Elise. He writes it all down. And then they see each other at the party, but she doesn't talk to him. So the whole pocket watch is gone. Mm Mm-hmm. She died that night, though. So that yeah. holds true in the book and in the movie. And he's like, oh, my God, she missed me so much. She had a heart attack and died. I'm such a great <laughs> I'm such a great person. <laughs> he thought the world of himself. He really did. He really did. He was like, no, it's fine. This I'm I can do. I can travel in time. Sure. I'm I am literally such an alpha bro. I believe that time itself will bend itself to my wishes if I want to get with that girl. And it does, maybe, (laughs) possibly. I don't know. Or or he just imagines it. Like, I Am Legend is a good short story, right? It's way better than any adaptation I've ever seen of it. Because it's the question, because the storyline in the short story is the guy that's killing all the vampires he goes out he's the last human he goes out every day and finds them and kills them while they're sleeping and then he ends up taking in this girl that he thinks is still human and you find out later that she's a vampire and she she came to kill him because he is their boogeyman because he comes at night or he comes while they're sleeping and he kills them in their sleep and so, but they have a whole civilization. Yeah, they are the people that live in the world now. He's the only one that's different, and so he's the one who's going out and killing them. He's the monster, and that's the point of the whole short story: is that he is the boogeyman. He is the monster because he's the one who's killing them, and it's great. And I love that that it no one none of the adaptations have ever captured that. They're like, listen, what if there was a world full of vampires and they were bad and shit and they were trying to kill him? And this is the last man standing. Oh, okay, right, you f- fuck it, f- fuck it, fine. Okay, whatever. I don't care because Hollywood in general doesn't want to make the human the bad guy. Right. I mean, it, but like, it's just it's that's great. Like, I, I'm and Rich, I love. I'm here for that. Richard Matheson short story. I am legend. Great. 
somewhere in time was not that moment for me. And that's why I think we should definitely move on to what dreams may come. I want to know if this is a pattern or if this was just a bad book. I'm I'm all for it. So I propose we uh, do that next. We'll do a, a Richard Matheson compilation series. Because <laughs> then we could do I Am Legend. We could do Omega Man. We could do Last Man on Earth. We could do a Will Smith well, okay. I Am Legend. I've watched all three. I really liked Last Man on Earth because, you know, Vincent Price. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was middle of the road with Omega Man. The Will Smith movie could go away and I could care less. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was just a vanity project for him. And they were trying to make it something that they could possibly get a sequel out of. And nah. right. they no. missed the whole point. I think that if you took a movie like I Am Legend really hand it off to like a 24 neon. I think they could find somebody, find a writer and get something that would be true to the novel rather than, or even a decent independent film company. Hey guys, Mm -hmm. block out films. Go do this. I mean, can you imagine (laughs) a movie that nails that twist where you have the, like the 28 days later horror movie, the whole time where you've got the lone human, who's trying to stay alive in a world full of monsters. And then you nail the twist at the end. Pull the old switcheroo. That's a great movie. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I don't know, like it's pack. It's right there for you. I don't know. Everyone's like, forget the end. Let's stick with the one human alone in a world full of monsters. That'll be great. And uh, maybe he'll find other humans near the end or this. They keep trying to make it something it's not. Yeah. That's what ruins it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it always makes me think of World War Z. Have you ever read World War Z, the book? Yes. If you, that's, a, there. that's a good audio book because it's a full graphic novel. and I mean, a graphic, graphic audio book. So they got like Nathan Fillion, um, Jerry Ryan, all kinds of actors to read it. And my favorite part about that is when we're actually Mark Hamill reads the voice of the soldier that we talked to who we follow all the way. He does. He's in every section because he's in every part of the war. And he talks about the Lamos, the last man on earth, like the dudes alone in cities who thought they were the last people alive. And so they like booby trapped all the cities. And they're like, it fucking sucked because we're trying to go in these cities and clean all the zombies out. And there's these booby traps by these dudes that died years ago. Because they thought they were the last ones. Because they thought they were the last ones and that they were protecting themselves by coming up with these elaborate like booby trap schemes. Anyway, I I always think about that. They're like, ah, this fucking sucks because now we have to clean up this city and this guy is like, there's like sharpened stakes and shit everywhere that fly at you if you step in the the wrong uh, place. Ancient Egyptian pyramids protecting the the dead. Yeah. But then they, when they made the World War Z movie, Oh, yeah, that, that's a ter- That's a perfect example of just completely missing the point. Right, and then apparently they made a video game I've called played World War game. Z based on the movie, and it is one of the more successful multiplayer, like first-person shooter games. And I think they've had three of them. I have played and the it's, uh, it's original just like one. This anyway. huge, ex- like unexpectedly think, successful franchise of video games. Well, World War Z was one based... of the most successful zombie movies ever. Exactly. Yeah. The version of uh, the, World War the Z bastardized got... version of the book. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. The, the, the version <laughs> of uh, World War Z that I got, the video game, uh, honestly, I thought it sucked. <laughs> I, I got it as like, it was like a $5, like they were trying to get rid of them. Mm-hmm. So this is mm-hmm. before it became popular. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I'm playing this. There's nobody online to play the game. So it was meant as like an online multiplayer. There's nobody there. I'm just, okay, well, by myself shooting these zombies. Okay. Yeah. It's about as interesting as you might expect that to be mm-hmm. yeah. for something that was intended to be an online multiplayer experience. Yep. Wasn't fun. Uh- yeah, Max Brooks wrote another book too that you might like if you're getting into audiobooks, and it's Devolution. Okay. And it's the true story of the Green Loop Sasquatch Massacre. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's about this green community 
That's but it's not like a hippie green community. It's, it's like bros. a tech bro green community where they have like they don't drive their cars because it's not eco friendly. So they have all their groceries delivered by drone. And they have high speed internet and they have like these really super high tech houses that are all really energy efficient because they're so highly technical. And then Mount Rainier erupts and they lose their internet and they don't have radio. They don't have maps because everything's in the cloud. Why do you need all that stuff? And uh, so they're trying to survive until somebody comes to rescue them. And Sasquatch shows up and starts killing everybody. (laughs) so good i think you'd like it but it's max brooks so you're like you know you get like the first person accounts from different people and then he's interviewing people about it and it's set up as this real account like a reporting of what happened after the fact and we are really... done here i'm you're gonna have to send that information to me because uh, <laughs> i don't want to forget and... that that does sound interesting i listened and... to it with my kids and even my kids liked it <laughs> <laughs> Another thing you should do is go listen to some interviews with Max Brooks about what happened to him career-wise after World War Z and why he now works for a think tank that works with the Department of Defense. And he he runs... um, he, he, He comes up with all of these war games and imagines just like he did in world war Z and devolution, like, Oh, here's this situation. What are the large scale sociopolitical economic consequences of this happening? And let's play this out to like train the high level military. Like he did such a good job in world war Z, the military (laughs) item for the tank. (laughs) So anyway, oh. <laughs> like for some of the most there, unlikely scenarios, right? Yes. Max Brooks, the son of Mel Brooks. The <laughs> <comedian>. <laughs> <Just> <sighs> is now part of a, some military think tank. Uh, just kind of. Yeah. Okay. Well, what happens if we do have a zombie apocalypse? How are we going to handle this? Exactly. Uh, They're like, oh, get Max. That's his exa- specialty. This, <laughs> this multi-star general approached him and he was like, we all loved what you did in World War Z. I think in we, some areas then, we're already having like a... invited him to come speak at West Point initially. Like a deer zombie apocalypse? <laughs> There's some kind of zombie flesh-eating virus where the deer are just basically wandering around, essentially dead. Huh. I Isn't have no follow-up in... information that's... because I didn't know we were going to get into this, so... Uh... <laughs> Well, that's, just, that's kind of how fine. Train we'll to Busan a, starts. Yeah, Train to Busan starts with the zombie deer. Yeah. But anyway, I think we should put What Dreams May Come up next on the docket. Sounds yep. good to me. And then we will re- readdress our feelings about this book and about whether or not we think Richard Matheson just missed or if he just only occasionally hit. And I think that's probably a good place to leave it. What do we like better? I liked the movie better. I liked the movie better. I I'm about 50 50. I'll be honest with you. I like them both for different reasons. That's fair. They did. uh, He did not try to make a, a particularly believable or kind character in this film. It was almost just melodrama and obsession from point A to point B. And his obsession was basically what undid him in the end anyway. Yeah. I don't think that would have translated to a decent movie back then. I think what they did with the movie, uh, cleaning it up and making it more of a romantic film than, I mean, there was still quite a bit of obsession in it, but not to the level of creepy perv running throughout the entire book. Yeah. Creepy, soon to be dying perv that was just yeah. trying to live out his last bit of fantasy. Yeah, I uh, love gonna... bombing a woman. So, yeah, I'm 50-50, honestly. I, I, I kind of like them equally. I'm glad that we did it this way because I think if I had read the book first and then went to see the movie, I probably would have liked the movie a little less. Yeah. I mean, kudos to Christopher Reeve for making that character likable. Yeah. 
And making and, the uh, love story believable because they don't change the timeline. It still all happens in like 48 hours. Kudos to uh, Christopher Plummer for uh, taking <laughs> that mess and uh, basically making me want to read this book. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't like, satisfy anything, but Christopher no. Plummer tried. And that's what matters in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I had to watch the movie a couple times just to make sure I didn't miss something. It's like they had to have left something on the cutting room floor because this is not explained. All right. Well, I think that's probably a good place to leave it. So. So remember, sometimes the strangest things are the most beautiful, too. So be who you are and love what you love. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Bye.